we live in a society that thrives on instant gratification, that the fast, easy way is the best way. And unfortunately, when it comes to long-term weight loss, we need to flip that paradigm. The status quo is not working. The status quo is actually making us sicker. Clinical specialist, Dr. Morgan Nolte. The goal is not losing weight. What we care about is long-term sustainable body recomposition, losing fat mass, gaining lean muscle mass in a way that is healthy for us physically, mentally, and emotionally. Weight Watchers has a lot of zero point foods like fruits and vegetables. However, some of those zero point foods spike your blood sugar and they spike your insulin and they contribute to fat storage. And you can see a rise in your insulin for up to 20 years before you would ever be flagged as pre-diabetic or diabetic from an A1C or a glucose reading. So semaglutide, it's also known as Ozempic or Wegovy, it's a GLP-1 agonist. And GLP-1 is a substance in your body that makes you feel full. Protein, fiber, and water do the exact same thing. So many people are way overeating carbohydrates and it's spiking their blood sugar, spiking the insulin. And if that happens over and over again, they're gonna develop insulin resistance. So when we're thinking about how do I structure a meal properly, it's number one, Hey there, friends. Welcome once again to the Happy Habit Podcast. I'm Matthew. I'm here talking health, well-being and self-improvement every Monday and Thursday. If you're enjoying the content, show your support, like, subscribe, share with other people who you think might get value from tuning in. Leave the podcast a comment if you're on YouTube and uh, leave us a, a positive rating if you think we've earned it. You can do so on iTunes and on Spotify. Now, four in every 10 people alive right now are obese. It's a very, very serious problem. And with that in mind, I'm speaking with a person today who is passionate about this subject and how to tackle it. Dr. Morgan Nolte is a clinical specialist with a particular interest in sustainable weight loss management using the insulin resistance model combined with mindset and behaviour change. Find out how sleep deprivation and stress impact blood sugar and insulin levels. We hear why, from a glucose regulation perspective, muscle mass maintenance, especially as we age, is so important. We also hear about the importance of resistance training and protein intake if you're trying to lose weight. We discuss weight loss drugs. Are they good or bad? Expect to hear about the importance of doing inner work as part of any sustainable weight management lifestyle you may adopt. Learn about dietary recommendations for menopausal women. And we also ask, what does a healthy breakfast look like? And lots more besides. This is a terrific and a fascinating discussion with an expert in her field. Enjoy this conversation with Dr. Morgan Nolte. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today, Dr. Morgan Nolte. 40% of the world currently, 3 billion people are obese. I'm interested to hear your views on what is driving this epidemic of obesity. There's so many things. Uh, it's definitely multifaceted. And I think a big part is actually our intolerance of being uncomfortable. I think we live in a society that thrives on instant gratification, that the fast, easy way is the best way. And unfortunately, when it comes to long-term weight loss, we need to flip that paradigm because sometimes behavior change can take a while. And it's not always easy and it's not always comfortable. So I think at the core of it, it comes down to getting the right information about nutrition, exercise, sleep, stress, the hormonal impacts that really contribute to obesity, but then also not stopping there. We also have to be a very good student of ourselves and of our own behavior and of our own thoughts and emotions that drive our eating and exercise and sleep and stress patterns and get very good at mastering those thoughts and emotions so that we can change our behavior long term. It's interesting. You were talking about information there. I spoke with uh, journalist Nina Teicholz there recently, who mm. who has been on a crusade in relation to uh, fat and saturated fat in the diet for, for many, many years. Indeed, she's written many articles and books about that very subject. How much of that uh, panoply of different influences that you alluded to there, how much of it comes down to that uh, confusion of information that's out there at the moment, which includes misinformation and disinformation? 
Yeah, that's true. And I think a lot of it is coming from a good place. I don't think researchers uh, or government agencies come from a place that we're going to uh, deceive people and make them sick. It's coming from a good place. However, as Nina is doing such excellent work and others in the field, they're pointing out that, hey, the status quo is not working. The status quo is actually making us sicker. How can we rethink our nutrition principles? How can we go above what government agencies are telling us to do and think for ourselves and make decisions for ourselves and stop this group think that has gotten us to this sick point? Well, part of that status quo is uh, an overemphasis on the caloric model of obesity. And uh, you suggest shifting the focus away from that caloric model uh, to the insulin model of obesity. Could you tell us what the difference between the two is? Absolutely. So calories are just a man-made unit to measure energy in a food. Your body doesn't necessarily recognize calories. It recognizes energy. And in order to use those calories, we need hormones. Everything in our body is automatically controlled by hormones. How fast your hair grows, how fast your nails grow, how fast you breathe, how fast your heart beats. All of that is automatically controlled as is your body weight and how much body fat you store. So there are things that we can do to influence our hormones, namely insulin. And that's the one I really like getting into because that's your fat creation and storage hormone. And so many people have grown up with the belief, as I did too, that if you want to lose weight, it's all about eating less and exercising more. And the problem with that model is that it doesn't emphasize quality of food. You can eat less Twinkies, you can eat less whatever you're currently eating, cheeseburgers and fast food, and lose weight. And when you think about that, it does not set you up for long-term health. There's a few foundational things that we have to focus on when it comes to long-term health. And this requires switching your mindset from the goal is not losing weight. We don't care about that. What we care about is long-term sustainable body recomposition, losing fat mass, gaining lean muscle mass in a way that is healthy for us physically, mentally, and emotionally. That requires a completely different strategy and mindset than simply eating less and exercising more. Another thing that I, I like to, it's the illusion of truth is what I call it. You hear the same message over and over and over again from different entities, like Weight Watchers, for example. Weight Watchers has a lot of zero point foods, like fruits and vegetables. However, some of those zero point foods spike your blood sugar and they spike your insulin and they contribute to fat storage. So if you're only following somebody else's rules on a diet and you're not learning for yourself, how does food impact my blood sugar, which in turn impacts my insulin, you will never figure this out. And so I, I always encourage people, be a good student of your own body. When we're talking about insulin, I think let's get to the baseline of what is insulin. Insulin is a hormone made by your pancreas and it is released when your blood sugars go up. And your blood sugars go up, especially after you have a high carbohydrate meal with refined carbohydrates like pasta or rice or a bunch of fruit. So when we're thinking about insulin, it's important to recognize there are three different kinds of macronutrients. There's carbohydrates, like I just mentioned, there's proteins, and there's dietary fats. So from the caloric model of obesity, they say eat a low fat diet because fats have the most calories. There is nine calories per gram of fat compared to four for protein and carbohydrates. But from the insulin model, that's not necessarily true. So from the insulin model of obesity, carbohydrates, especially refined starches and sugars, have the highest insulin response. They spike your blood sugar, so your insulin has to be released to push the blood sugar back down to baseline. Fiber is another type of carbohydrate that has a reverse response, essentially. It slows the digestion and absorption of other nutrients, so fiber is just fine. Protein has a moderate insulin response, worth the trade-off because you need protein for healthy muscles. Dietary fat has the lowest insulin response. So when we're looking at things from the insulin model, the question is always, how does this choice impact my insulin and my inflammation? And then when we're looking at it from the calorie model, it's 
how many calories is in this food? Is it a low fat food? The other really nice thing about the insulin approach to obesity is you have more levers to pull. From the caloric model, it's eat less, move more. So it's very much diet and exercise focused. From the insulin model, it gets to the root cause of your hormonal issues because many people have elevated insulin levels not from eating too much or from eating too many carbohydrates, but from sleep deprivation or chronic stress. Because both of those things will raise a hormone called cortisol, which is your stress hormone. When cortisol is up, your blood sugars go up because your muscles think that you're stressed and you're going to need to fight or flee a situation. So your body naturally raises blood sugar for more available energy for those muscles to soak in and use. But if your stress is a, is a work email or a fight with your partner or conflict with your child, that's that blood sugar is just hanging out in the bloodstream. It's not being absorbed by the muscles and used. So what happens then is insulin is released and that pushes the insulin up even more. And I tell people, I know that it's so much easier just to cut carbs than it is to have honest conversations with your boss about your boundaries or shut Netflix off and go to bed on time. But those are going to be the needle movers. And that's what I mean when I say we have to study our own behavior more. I, I was going to say as much, but really it's more than what we study. A lot of people consume content. A lot of people read books. A lot of people take online courses. When was the last time you sat down and studied your own behavior? That is really how we start to change it. It sounds like a much, much more comprehensive approach, a holistic approach even. Uh, you mentioned insulin there. What is insulin resistance then in that context? Because this is a term which we hear an awful lot about today. Yeah, insulin resistance is essentially resistance to the hormone insulin. And what that means is your body gets resistant to the effects of insulin so that it requires more and more to get the job done. And a beautiful example of this is type 2 diabetes. With type 2 diabetes, your insulin resistance is rising for up to two decades before you actually see rises in your blood sugar and A1C level. Right now, at least in the U.S., physicians are not regularly checking insulin levels. However, research has shown that you can see a rise in your insulin because it needs more and more to get the job done, right, for up to 20 years before you would ever be flagged as pre-diabetic or diabetic from an A1C or a glucose reading. And that's one of my passions to get out there is we can do so much more to prevent diabetes if we are addressing insulin levels and insulin resistance earlier than if we are waiting for the downstream effect of elevated A1C and blood glucose levels. And so then what's the relationship between elevated insulin and systemic inflammation? They go hand in hand. So it's almost like this negative spiral. The more inflammation you have, the more insulin resistance you can develop. And insulin resistance in and of itself can derive inflammation. So insulin in high levels is inflammatory. That's why it's just this negative cycle that drives each other. And that's why we advocate a low insulin and inflammation lifestyle. Because if you're only focusing on insulin, you might be missing some really important pieces of the picture, like refined seed oils, which Nina, as you mentioned earlier, is huge on. Refined seed oils like canola oil, soybean oil, those are a dietary fat. They're a pure fat. They're not going to spike your blood sugar. They're not going to raise your insulin, but they will contribute to cellular inflammation. And over time, inflammation will drive insulin resistance. That's another reason we see a lot of people who take certain medications for an autoimmune condition like rheumatoid arthritis. It's a very inflammatory condition. They will also struggle with insulin resistance because of that baseline inflammation that they have in their body. So should we be eating that in order to keep our insulin levels low exclusively? And muscle mass. So we have to think about the big picture. Because if you only wanted to eat to keep insulin low, you could follow a pretty ketogenic lifestyle and think that you were setting yourself up for long-term success. Oh, my insulin, low, my insulin is low. That's great. But what about long-term? That's where muscle mass comes into the picture. After you eat a meal, at least 80% of the carbohydrates are going to be deposited in your muscles. Your muscle is the reservoir for any glucose that we eat. And so I like to equate it to a garage. 
If you have a little bit of muscle mass, you can fit one car in your garage, not very much glucose. If you have a lot of muscle mass, you can fit more cars in your garage before the overflow goes in your driveway or on the street. That's similar to where you can eat more carbohydrates. They're going to be stored in your muscle as glycogen before the spillover goes to your fat tissue. So that is one reason that muscle mass is important is simply glucose regulation before it's stored as fat. That's going to help us because excess fat is inflammatory. When we're thinking about nutrition, how do we want to eat? That's what I want people to think about is number one, how will this affect my insulin? Number two, am I getting the right stimulus to build and maintain muscle mass? And what that means is one gram of high quality protein per pound of ideal body weight a day. So for me, that's about 135 to 140 grams of protein a day. I'm five foot eight. And even if ideal seems unrealistic to you, that doesn't matter for this specific number. I recommend people go to a body mass index chart. You can just Google BMI chart, find your height, and then find a weight in the green zone or the healthy range. Go towards the lower end, and that's going to be your daily protein goal. Because a lot of people, honestly, they're not even, they don't even know what is an ideal body weight for me. That's the only reason I recommend using that BMI chart. We can't stop there though. From a muscle mass standpoint, you need an adequate dose of leucine, which is an essential amino acid found in high, found in higher amounts and high quality protein. And we, there's something called an anabolic trigger. And that's, you, you have to have enough leucine in a meal to trigger new muscle protein synthesis, which means maintaining and building muscle mass. And this is the biggest dietary mistake that I see pe people make is under eating protein per meal and per day. So three grams of leucine, that essential amino acid, is found in about 30 grams of high quality protein, meaning animal-based protein, eggs, meat, dairy, those types of foods, whey protein. If you are a vegan or a vegetarian, what I would suggest is a branch chain amino acid with supplement with each meal because plant-based proteins are naturally lower in leucine. So you're going to want to be mindful of boosting that leucine content per meal. So 30 to 50 grams of protein per meal is my general recommendation. And then following that, I typically recommend what is your personal carbohydrate threshold? So wearing a continuous glucose monitor can be really helpful to understand what is my personal carbohydrate threshold. Mine is about 30 grams of net carbs per meal. I can eat that amount of net carbs and stay under about 110 milligrams per deciliter for my blood glucose. Levels Health is a, co a continuous glucose monitoring company doing really good work on what are optimal levels of blood sugar management. And 110 is what they say, your blood sugar really should not go much higher than 110. And it shouldn't rise more than 30 milligrams per deciliter after any given meal. So that's what I mean when I say, what's your personal carbohydrate threshold? So many people are way overeating carbohydrates and it's spiking their blood sugar, spiking the insulin. And if that happens over and over again, they're going to develop insulin resistance. So when we're thinking about how do I structure a meal properly, it's number one, 30 to 50 grams of protein. Number two, ideally about 10 grams of fiber. I have an ultimate food guide. You can link that up. It has so many different foods, it, it, fiber tables. I mean, if people want the food ideas, it's in there. It's free. The third is healthy fats. So again, in that ultimate food guide, it breaks down the different kinds of fats. They can look at that. But then keeping those starches and sugars low. So your net carbohydrates are going to include the starches and the sugars, not the fiber. And that's how I recommend structuring a meal plus plenty of water. And when you eat like that, when you eat high protein, high fiber, some healthy fats, lower carbohydrate, not necessarily no carbohydrate, um, you will see amazing results. You're going to have such improved satiety between meals. So you don't feel like snacking all the time because that's not good for your blood sugar and insulin levels. You're going to have better ability to grow and maintain lean muscle mass. And that is so important as we age. I'm a geriatric physical therapist by trade. And so I saw so many falls, a lot of sarcopenia or muscle wasting, a lot of fractures. And I'm very passionate about helping people improve their quality of life earlier in life 
and maintain that so that they don't need a geriatric physical therapist and months in rehab after a fall. Can we talk about dietary recommendations for women who are going through perimenopause and menopause? Will their recommendations and needs from a dietary perspective differ greatly from what you've referenced already there? Yeah, so that's an interesting time in a woman's life where stress is elevated for many reasons, but hormonal stress. Your hormones are kind of up and down, up and down. You might have aging parents. Your children might be in a stressful phase. You might be heavy in your career. So there's multiple stressors. And then the, those hormonal changes can really impact sleep, which is one reason the stress and the sleep, why we really hone in on those aspects of the lifestyle. The tricky thing in this season of life of perimenopause is going to be intermittent fasting because that is a really great tool for weight loss. However, it is a, it's a, a good stress, but it's still a stress on your body. And so if you already have a lot of baseline stress from work, family, sleep deprivation, I don't really want to see you fasting more than about 14 to 16 hours a day. I would rather see you focus on balanced, nutrient-dense meals. That's going to be one major difference for people, for women who are in perimenopause compared to women who are postmenopausal or who are pre, you know, who are before perimenopause, who have a regular cycle. They can just learn how to fast around their cycle. Women who are in postmenopause, they can fast however they like based on how they're feeling. That's going to be the main difference is people on perimenopause really have to dial in the other levers that they can control because intermittent fasting may not be the best lever for them to pull at that season in life if they're already really stressed out at baseline. But nutritionally, the other thing that's important is micronutrients. So we want to be getting our vitamins. We want to be getting our minerals. We want to be getting our essential omega-3 fatty acids. I think a lot of people underestimate the importance of minerals. So when we're talking about fasting, using electrolytes during fasting can make a huge difference in how you feel. So I talk a lot about macronutrients, but we also want to keep micronutrients in the picture too, because those are going to just help your cells run smoothly. They're going to help with inflammation levels. And in perimenopause, that's a great season of life to focus on those controllable factors. You mentioned uh, supplementation just briefly earlier. Uh, could you talk to us just more generally about supplementation, whether it's generally necessary if you have a balanced diet? Not necessary if you have a balanced diet, in my personal opinion. If you're a vegan or a vegetarian, you're going to need like a vitamin B12 supplement. It's a nut nutrient only found in animal products. I personally take an omega-3, so an EPA and DHA supplement and a prenatal vitamin since I'm still of childbearing age, I want to be sure that I don't have any nutrient deficiencies just in case we were to get pregnant. And that kind of covers my basis for the day. The other supplement that I've taken off and on is creatine, which is something to help exercise performance and build muscle. But in general, I don't recommend spending a lot of money on supplements because it's one more thing you have to take. It's one more thing you have to spend your money on. And if you can just get it from real food, I think that's always a better choice. There's greater bioavailability of the vitamins and the minerals anyways when you're getting it from food. The only other thing that I supplement is electrolytes. So if I'm fasting for longer than 14 to 16 hours in a day, especially 16, that's kind of my personal cutoff when I like to take electrolytes. I really like the LMNT brand. And depending on your on your brain and your tolerance for sweets, they have really good flavors that do that they're sweetened with stevia though. So they might increase your sweets cravings. But if if you want something besides just water in your fasting window, those ones are great. Or you can just choose the unsweetened ones. Where do you stand on breakfast if you're not ascribing to intermittent fasting for 16 hours? A lot of people will gorge themselves at breakfast time because they haven't had anything to eat for eight or 10 hours. So what are your thoughts on what the breakfast should look like, a healthy, balanced one? Yeah, a healthy, balanced breakfast is just like any other meal. 30 to 50 grams of protein, about 10 grams of fiber. Keeping starches and sugars low is excellent but you don't need it. And I think that that's another group think principle. Um, Kellogg's did a, a lot of marketing in the 70s and the 80s to get their cereal products on the market. And that's really where breakfast is the most important meal of the day came from was a cereal company to sell more of their products. What I tend to do for breakfast is I keep it pretty low carb, high protein. Sometimes I put in more fats than others, but my go-to lately is a whey protein shake. 
I've been getting up at 5 a.m. I do my mindset work, my visu- my visualization, my meditation, mindset work. I get my workout in. And then right after that, I have a whey protein shake. It's pretty low in calories, so it's not very energy dense, but at least it refuels my muscles with that minimum dose of 30 grams of protein right away. And then I just have two primary meals a day. That That seems to be a really, really nice pattern for me. Because if I don't work out first thing in the morning, number one, it's it might not get done and that's not good. But number two, the quality is not as good. My energy levels are best for a good workout in the morning. So from a breakfast standpoint, keep it low in carb, high in protein, put some healthy fats and fiber in there. It needs to be big enough. Like a lot of people are just having like two eggs and maybe half of an English muffin. And that's not enough protein to get you to lunch. That is why you want to snack at 10 a.m. The other thing to watch out for at breakfast is added sugar. There is so much added sugar hiding in breakfast foods. I used to get as much sugar as what is in a Snickers bar in my coffee creamer every morning. I was, yeah, crazy. I was having two tablespoons of the Coffee Mate Peppermint Mocha coffee creamer, and I'd have two cups. So four tablespoons, that has 20 grams of sugar, which is just about as much as in a Snickers bar. And so we have to watch out for those added sugars that are going to spike blood sugar and insulin levels right away in the morning. That is not what we want. We want a nice stable morning to control those carb cravings for the rest of the day. I want to move to the subject of these weight loss drugs that are in the headlines at the moment. I know Oprah is now on Ozempic and semaglutide is also in the headlines. Could you talk to us about, first of all, how these work and what your opinion of them is? Yeah. So semaglutide, it's also known as Ozempic or Wegovy. It's a, it's a GLP-1 agonist. And GLP-1 is a substance in your body that makes you feel full. Protein, fiber, and water do the exact same thing. So if you're eating a protein-dense diet, you're getting enough fiber, you're drinking water, include some healthy fats, eat just like we're talking about, you should be satiated enough to not need the medication. And I know that it is so tempting. I know. But part of that is created by your own expectation of how fast you should see results, how fast you should see progress. And if people want to take that, no judgment, no shame. I think that there's enough body shaming and all of that going around. However, in my personal opinion, I don't want to use this substance if I can get the same effect from natural food that I'm already paying for. I'm, I'm kind of fiscally minded in that way. If I don't need something, I don't want to pay for something. And it is an investment for a lot of people. I think the other thing that I don't believe is brought top of mind enough in this conversation is the mindset aspect of weight loss. If semaglutide is your cornerstone mechanism of losing weight, there's a few things that can go wrong. Number one, you're so full that you don't even want to eat. So what happens is you're underdosing your protein because you're like, I can't eat anymore. I am so full. And so when you underdose your protein during weight loss, you lose more muscle mass. And when you lose more muscle mass during weight loss, your metabolism slows down. And when your metabolism slows down, you are way more likely to regain any weight that you lose. Number two, these medications can have a side effect, many side effects, but one can be decreased energy levels. The decreased energy levels and the fatigue can contribute to somebody not wanting to engage in resistance training or strength training. They don't have the gas in the tank, so they don't resistance train as they're losing weight. And if you're not eating protein and you're not resistance training as you're losing weight, as I just said, you're going to lose muscle mass and any weight you do lose is going to be more likely to be regained when you stop the medication. Number three, when you stop the medication, your levels of satiety are going to rebound. And that's why there's this ozempic rebound going on because people are getting off the med, their hunger is even worse than when they started the med and then they eat more. So we have this perfect storm for weight regain. If somebody isn't eating enough protein and they're not strength training, they lose weight, but they lose muscle mass. So their metabolism slows down to what it was before they started losing weight. And then they have a higher appetite than they did before they started losing weight. They're going to regain that weight. So those are some of the physiological concerns that I have about semaglutide. And the other one is the psychological one, because you cannot out-supplement and out-medicate an unhealthy lifestyle, and you cannot circumvent the required lifestyle changes needed to keep the weight off. 
You have to make the changes in your diet, the changes in your mindset, the changes in your exercise, the changes in your sleep, the changes in your stress if you want to keep the weight off. And so if you're taking semaglutide, you might be seeing short-term results. But in my opinion, it could be, if you're not also doing this inner work and the habit change work, it could be at the expense of your long-term results, which goes back to the beginning of our conversation that the goal is not losing weight. The goal is losing weight and keeping it off and improving your health. So when we use a some people, I'm not saying everybody at all, some people are using semaglutide as a crutch as the cornerstone of their weight loss program. I'm gonna take this and then I don't have to worry about anything else. I'm already kind of maxed out in other areas of my life. I can't, I just can't even, you know, I can't even go to, I can't even go there. Well, the problem, why you're not going there is why you are overweight in the first place. So why are we delaying the necessary inner work that must be done to keep the weight off? So that's my only concern with some glutide is that people aren't putting in some, not all, again, some people using it as their primary mechanism are avoiding the necessary inner work, the thought change work, the emotional control work that drives their eating habits in the first place. They're, they're delaying the, ne the necessary habit and lifestyle changes that will be required for them to keep the weight off. And unfortunately, I believe sometimes they're setting themselves up for disappointment and just less money in their bank account. That's my personal opinion on some glutide. It may come off as a little bit harsh. I work with so many people that do this inner work. And the thing that you don't get from some glutide is pride. The thing you don't get from some glutide is self-accountability, is developing your discipline. You cannot get that from a pill. You get that from showing up for yourself day in and day out and doing the work. And that is the inner change that happens when you lose weight. And that is really what people want. And how you know that that doesn't just happen with weight loss, go put on a backpack, put 20 pounds in the backpack and walk around for 10 minutes around your neighborhood and then take the backpack off and tell me if you feel pride. Tell me if you feel more disciplined. Tell me if you feel excited about who you are as a person and how this journey helped you become more mentally tough. You can't. You just took weight off. You didn't do any of the inner work that reaps the benefits of that inner change. And I think that's that's my biggest message on semaglutide and other, you know, quick fix diets and all that stuff. You can take the weight off, but it, that doesn't necessarily, it, it doesn't make you change on the inside. People think it will, but it doesn't. The change comes from the work and we cannot, you just can't get around the work required. So you can delay the work, but you can't get around it. You're going to have to come back to it at some point. And that is the fun part for me is seeing that inner growth, that that transformation, the self-confidence, the new identity that comes when you do that inner work. Inner work. So that's my opinion on semaglutide. You're certainly very passionate about it. I, I love am. your answer because I've asked that question of a few people on this podcast in recent months. And uh, I think that's arguably the most comprehensive answer I've been given to date. Thank you. I, I just, I answered that in my Instagram stories not too long ago because what, someone emailed me and they're like, I got four friends on this medication. It's super tempting. What are your honest thoughts about it? And I said, mm, time to share my honest thoughts, even though not everybody's like, going to like them, but we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to study ourselves. That's what I mean when we just have to stop the quick fix approaches and recognize change takes time and that's a beautiful thing like what a gift that we have the time to change so changing our mindset is where it all begins and that's insulin resistance and mindset are equal passions of mine well i'm all about uh, changing mindsets and habits on this podcast my final question for you dr nolte tell us a little bit about zivli its mission and how people can find out more about it absolutely so zivli what it means is to live a low insulin and inflammation lifestyle we have an online program. It's an online course and coaching program. We open enrollment a couple times a year. Our next enrollment is going to be September of 24 when this one comes out. Um, if people find us before then and they want to get started, we also have an insulin resistance diet starter course. That one is available anytime. They can find that on our website. It goes over macronutrients, how to eat to lower insulin resistance, and some really awesome just baseline education on insulin resistance, like what it is, how to test for it, what are the signs and symptoms, what are the health sequela? So I, I recommend people start with the starter course. And then if they're interested in joining our full program, that's more comprehensive on all the lifestyle changes we talked about. And we go deep into mindset and habit change. Definitely join our wait list for September. 
Um, our our website is just zivli.com. So Z-I-V-L-I.com. They can get that free ultimate food guide on there. Um, I have a podcast, Reshape Your Health. I have a YouTube channel. We just broke 100,000 subscribers. So I was really excited to reach that goal. And our passion is just helping people change their lifestyle with a low insulin and inflammation lifestyle. So again, geriatric physical therapist, I saw heartbreaking diseases, dementia, stroke, heart attacks, falls, amputations, peripheral neuropathy. So many things can be prevented if you get and you stay healthy early enough. And the breaking point was I would I'd work with people in their 70s, their 80s, and I would see their adult children in their 50s and 60s following along in their footsteps. And I thought, oh my gosh, I want to work with their children to prevent them getting to the to the phase where their parents are. And so that's really the type of people that we tend to work with are people in middle age who are like, I am ready to get healthy. Like I have been prioritizing my family, my career. It is my time. I need to focus on this for me so that I don't end up my, like my parents or aunt or uncle or whatever else because that's our passion. And we recognize that in order to help people do that, they need good information, but they also need good systems for changing their habits. And so that's really where our program is, that comprehensive mindset and strategy side of the equation. Well, your passion certainly comes through abundantly. Uh, can I thank you for coming on the podcast today? Because as you say yourself, you're super busy with your own podcast, with Zivli and with your YouTube channel. And congratulations on your 100,000 subscribers. I can only wish to get to that level. Uh, Dr. Morgan Nolte, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. It was my pleasure. It's a joy to be able to spread the message on insulin resistance. And I hope if one person got something from this, then it's a win for me. So thank you for having me. Well, thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Happy Habit Podcast. If you liked it and any of the previous episodes, show your support. You can like, subscribe, and share with other people who you think might enjoy these episodes and leave a comment on YouTube and leave us a positive rating on iTunes and on Spotify. Until next time, stay happy. 